Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is October 26, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 8. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so every day. So let's look now at Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 8, which says this, Hear, O Israel, that you are to cross over the Jordan today to go into the uh, and to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakin, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak. Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He would destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. And that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember, and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 8. Now, this passage comes in the middle of Moses' second and longest speech in a section that gives several exhortations on life as a covenant people. In fact, Deuteronomy 9, 1 through Deuteronomy 10, 11, it forms a unit in which Moses warns the people about the possibility of unfaithfulness based on past failures. Now, in verses 1 through 2, Moses tells the people that they are to cross the Jordan and take over the Canaanite nations. He describes these people as those people, as nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakin, whom you know, and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak. Now, the power of the nations and their people are highlighted. These verses have a lot in common with Deuteronomy 128, but the greatness of these people is highlighted as an excuse for not going to battle them. Here, the same truth is used to remind the people that the God who goes out with them to battle is greater than these enemy forces. So the next verse says in verse 3, Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Now, as we've looked at uh, in this uh, series through Deuteronomy, the challenge is an excuse for giving up the battle. In chapter 9, the same challenge is an occasion to prove God's ability. Some, when faced with a huge challenge, begin to grumble as if to say that God has forsaken or failed them. They throw in the towel even before the battle begins. As leaders, our task is to do what Moses often did, to help boost the people's faith by challenging them to persevere, to believe in God's power without giving up. Others say that if God has permitted such a huge challenge, it is because he planned a great victory. Now the challenge spurs them to be more determined as they work with greater intensity until the battle is won. These two reactions are seen when Christians face problems in marriage or when a project they started believing it is of God encounters major problems. One group gives up while the other keeps believing that it is God's will for them to persevere until victory comes. Countless couples who are now enjoying a relatively happy home in life will testify to God's sufficient grace carrying them through tough years in their marriages as they strove to make the marriage succeed amid much conflict. 
most great leaders who have succeeded in tough tasks will, if asked, talk of huge challenges they face before the success came. They refused to give up because they knew that God was greater than their challenges. Now in verse 3, Moses tells the people that the Lord their God goes over before them as a consuming fire to destroy and subdue their enemies just as he promised. Now, we've already discussed how God is described as a consuming fire when we looked at Deuteronomy 4.24. But there the figure was used to say that he will punish Israel if they follow idols. Here it is used when describing God's ability to destroy and even subdue the enemies of Israel. Notice how the same quality of God's wrath is used to describe God's punishment of those who identify as his people and of those who don't. The way the figure of God as a consuming fire is used here can be a great source of encouragement to us. We often encounter huge enemies that seem to stop us from experiencing what we know to be clearly God's will for us. It may be the fiery darts of Satan coming in the form of temptation or discouragement. It may be a human enemy. It may be what seems to be an obstacle that we cannot surmount. We must not lose heart. Our God goes before us as a consuming fire that will destroy and subdue all the hindrances to his plan. Now, the power of the enemy may seem to be much greater than our own, and we may seem dwarfed by this huge giant. But we can trust in God's ability. We can concentrate on obedience, knowing that the key that opens the door to his availability is our obedience. Let's not be afraid of our enemies. Now in verse 3, Moses says that the battle is won by God when he says he will destroy them and subdue them before you. But God uses the people as his instruments saying, so you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly. Their part is to obey. Earlier when God asked them to go and take the land, they refused. And as a result, they had to wander in the wilderness for 38 years. This time, however, they will obey and they might become proud and even take uh, the credit for the victory. So Moses says this in Deuteronomy 9, 4. Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Now, many contemporary commentators think that these quote marks indicate what people could say should end at the end of this verse. That is, Moses sees the possibility of the Israelites saying that they won this victory because God thought that they were righteous and the Canaanites were wicked. Verse 5 says, because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. They would be right about the wickedness of the Canaanites, but wrong about their own righteousness being the cause of the conquest. Three times in verses 4, 5, and 6 of our chapter, Moses states that it is not because of their righteousness that the victory will come. The repetition highlights the fact that this is the most important point in these three verses. How often we try to show that we deserve the blessings that we have received. People boast in the media, and it is not usually considered inappropriate. Even in Christian settings, people seem to think that they deserve to get the credit for some achievement of theirs. Some would preface a boastful statement with the words, I'm humbled, as if they were giving the credit to God. Some even plan or others get to plan felicitation ceremonies in order to honor themselves over such victory. I wish more people would rise up against these and even show that these are inappropriate and a waste of time. The Bible has a very high place for ceremonies and songs celebrating God's victory, but but all glory should go to the Lord. Testimony must have an important place in a Christian community life, but our experiences need to be shared in a way that are going to bring all glory to God. The great Scottish pastor, theologian James Denny, had framed in his church vestry the words, No man can bear witness to Christ and to himself at the same time. No man can give the impression that he himself is clever and that Christ is mighty to save. In a 1992 interview, an interviewer asked Billy Graham, What do you want people to say about you when you're gone? He said, This, I don't want people to say anything about me. I want them to talk about my Savior. The only thing I want to hear is Jesus saying, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But I'm not sure I'm going to hear that. Now, many testimonies we hear today draw attention more to the testifier than to God. A more Christian way to testify would be to show how helpless and desperately needy we were or how we messed up a situation and how God in his mercy intervened and saw us through. The thrust of verses 6 through 7 is that it is not 
not because of their righteousness, but in spite of their stubbornness, that God will give them the victory. So those who focus on their qualification for service are never going to be happy people. Deep down, they know that they don't deserve the honors they receive because their lives do not match up to God's standard of righteous. They cannot fully enjoy those honors because they are looking for honor on earth. They will feel cheated when not recognized. They, they will see the victories of others as threats to their position. And so they cannot enjoy the blessings that God gives uh, through others in the body. What freedom there is when you live with an ambition to deflect all glory to God. When God gets the glory, we are thrilled because we are one with him. So we do get glory from victories, but it is the reflected glory that we share over our Heavenly Father's victories. Besides, when you recognize that you don't deserve honor, everything you get becomes a bonus. Now, instead of being angry and not being recognized, we rejoice that we were given all this bonus blessings from God because it's all grace from God. Now, in addition to the wickedness of the nations, verse 5 ends with yet another reason for God's granting the people victory, saying that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so the key to victory is that it has gone towards accomplishing God's purposes for the history of the world. He has revealed some things about that history, and based on that revelation, we set the course of our lives and our work. This gives us confidence as we seek to serve God. The obstacles are huge, and sometimes we seem to be laboring with no results in sight. But God is working out His purposes, and our work is a building block used in constructing His kingdom. Today, we must understand that evangelism is God's agenda. We must not be surprised if we suffer for doing it. In fact, Scripture promises that this is going to happen in John 15, 20 and 2 Timothy 3, 12. You see, if we are faithful to our task, we'll find out that someday that the apparent defeats were actually means used by God to take his work forward. It is a great thrill to be used in the cause of the kingdom of God, which is moving towards the day when it will rule the whole universe. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, the world may not recognize this, but we know it's true. This is a source of great joy to us. The joy of thanksgiving for God's grace in using us is a significant a work. What is the best alternative there is to self-glorying? It surpasses by far the satisfaction that earthly glory brings. And after saying that God is not giving them the land because of the righteous, Moses says this in verse 6, For you are a stubborn people. Stubborn is usually translated stiff neck. The two Hebrew words used here literally mean hard of neck. Eugene Merrill describes it as used here as a means of unwillingness to submit to the yoke of the sovereignty of God. Often this is what leads to disobedience. We refuse to accept that God knows best and rebel against what happens to us. We lose joy and peace in believing. We try alternative paths to fulfill our aims. We lie. We take revenge. We, we go to another. We betray our friends or we marry an unbeliever. We reason that because God is not doing a good job looking after us, we must use other methods. Deuteronomy 9.7 says this, Remember and do not forget how you provoke the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And so Moses says this in verse 7, From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And then he goes on to describe a specific instance of this rebellion, the golden calf incident in Deuteronomy 9, 8 through 21. Sadly, many of us who serve the Lord have a similar testimony. We cannot say that God used us pr primarily because of our obedience. We can list a catalog of sins and shortcomings that would disqualify us from being used by God. But God has still used us. That does not mean we forget our failures. Notice how empathetic Moses' words about remembering their past sins are in verse 7. Remember and do not forget. Verse 6 starts with no therefore. Why is it so important to remember our past failures? Doesn't Paul speak about forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead in Philippians 3.13? 
Paul is speaking in Philippians 3 about forgetting those things that hinder our forward march. Most probably he means resting on our past achievements and becoming complacent, thinking we have quote-unquote arrived. It could also mean depression over past failures and sorrows. Moses is talking about something else. Their past sins revealed weak area in their lives. They needed to be watchful in those areas and not take risks by putting themselves into situations and making them vulnerable to temptation. So they must renounce their past failings so verses 7 through 8 say that the people provoked the Lord to wrath and verse 8 goes on and says and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you there was a move in the last century connected with scholars like C H Dodd to separate wrath from the nature of God these scholars argued that though the Old Testament presents God's wrath as part of his nature in the New Testament wrath is an impersonal force or cause and effect in response to sin and is not part of God's nature this would make it much like the karmic forces in Eastern religions by which individuals accrue good and bad merits respectively according to their thoughts and actions this determines what they will be and encounter in their next life however it, it can be amply demonstrated that both in the new testament and the old testament wrath is very much a part of god's nature it's been said that there are more references to wrath and anger of god in the word of god than the love of god possibly this is because wrath is a topic that we could easily ignore because it is not a pleasant topic about what to think or even talk about we must heed the advice of paul in romans 11 22 Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. There is very little teaching on the wrath of God in the church today, and the effects of this are disastrous. We cannot fully understand the meaning of salvation until we understand God's wrath over our sin that Christ took upon himself at the cross. How can we understand what it means to be saved if we do not know what we're being saved from? Salvation can become merely a plus that comes to our life and even makes it more meaningful rather than a transformation from death to life, from eternal damnation to eternal salvation. So without a proper understanding of wrath, we would not know how to have a healthy fear of God that is essential for healthy Christian living and worship. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 says this, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, the result of this neglect is the carelessness about our sin, about holiness and discipline that we see among Christians today. If we saw sin as something that provokes the Almighty God to anger, we would be more careful about living holy lives. The horror of sin would motivate us to flee from it, even though the majority of our contemporaries embrace it with relish. Our evangelism would also be affected because scripture teaches that sin and unbelief arouse the wrath of God in Romans 1, 18 through 32. That would spur us to evangelism so that we could save others by snatching them out of the fire, according to Jude 23. So let us look at light through the lens of God's working in this world. We can join him and march along his victorious way. Or we can disobey to our peril. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 26th. We've looked at Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 8. Until tomorrow, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.